What does malocclusion mean? We will answer this question by reporting a clinical case of evident malocclusion. Patient is in a occlusal state that orthodontists call malocclusion because he has a posterior unilateral cross bite and anterior open bite. It is a malocclusion that can be treated with a fixed orthodontic therapy and possibly in combination with an orthognathic surgery. Patient is in a occlusal state that orthodontists call malocclusion because he has a posterior unilateral cross bite and anterior open bite. It is a malocclusion that can be treated with a fixed orthodontic therapy and possibly in combination with an orthognathic surgery. Cross bite is another element of disturbance in normal occlusion because of which it is obligatorily treated together with the open bite. It is self-evident that an observer with a deterministic mindset facing a phenomenon of such evident occlusal incongruity considers cross bite and open bite the cause of malocclusion cause and effect, or vice versa. And it is obvious as well, that the observer recommends an orthodontic treatment to restore, a norm occlusion. This way of reasoning, means that, the model, masticatory system, is normalized to occlusion, and, if read backwards, it means that the occlusal discrepancy is the cause of malocclusion, and therefore, of disease of the masticatory system. But let's hear, what the two players say, the dentist and the patient, in the informative dialogue. The dentist tells the patient that he is suffering from severe malocclusion, and that, it should be treated to improve its aesthetics, and, chewing function. The patient, however, replies firmly. No way, I haven't the slightest idea to do it at all, doctor, because I might even have, an unrepresentative smile, but I eat very well. The dentist's reply is ready, so the practitioner insists by saying, but you have a serious malocclusion with an open bite, and a unilateral posterior cross bite, you should already have problems with bruxism, and swallowing, as well as posture. The patient closes the confrontation in a decisive way. Absolutely false, I chew very well, I swallow very well and, at night I snore a lot, so I don't grind, besides. I'm a sportsman and I don't have any postural disturbance. Now the conclusion remains very critical. We might be finding ourselves in front of a verbal language of the patient, which is misleading, because, it is not specific, and, does not respond to a detailed physiopathogenetic knowledge of the occlusal state, or, paradoxically, we are otherwise facing a machine language, converted into verbal language, which guarantees the integrity of the system. At this point, the situation is truly embarrassing, because, neither the patient nor the dentist, will be able to say, with certainty, that the system is in a, malocclusion state. It is, at this moment, that one remembers the criticism of the American Statistician Association, titled, Statistical Inference in the 21st Century. A world beyond p less than 0.05, which urges the researcher to accept uncertainty, be sensible reflective, open and modest in his statements, which basically translates, into a search of, interdisciplinarity. Interdisciplinarity could answer such a complex question. But it is nonetheless necessary to interpret the biological phenomenon, of malocclusion. With a stochastic form of mentis, of which, we will discuss in detail later. A stochastic observer, may observe, that there is a low probability that the patient, at the moment TN, is in a state of occlusal disease. As the patient's natural language indicates, ideal psychophysical health. Then it can be concluded that the occlusal discrepancy, could not be a cause, of neuromuscular and psychophysical functional disorder. In this case, therefore, the masticatory system cannot be normalized to the occlusion only. But a more complex model is needed too, so it has to be normalized to the, trigeminal nervous system. For this reason, the patient was subjected to a series of trigeminal electrophysiological tests, in order to assess the integrity of the trigeminal nervous system, despite, the malocclusion. We can see, the following output responses, which we report directly in figures 1b, 1c and 1d, with explanation in the caption, to simplify the discussion. 
the upper trace corresponds to the EMG trace of the right mass eta, and the lower to the left. This setting will be maintained for all other figures. The upper trace figure 1b, motor evoked potential from electrical transcranial stimulation of the trigeminal roots. Note the structural symmetry calculated by the peak to peak amplitude on the right and left mass eaters. Figure 1c, mandibular reflex evoked by percussion of the chin, through a triggered neurological hammer. Note, the functional symmetry calculated by the peak to peak amplitude on the right and left mass eaters. Figure 1d, mechanical silent period, evoked by percussion, of the chin through a triggered neurological hammer. Note, the functional symmetry calculated on the integral area of the right and left mass eaters. These tests, and their description, by now, should only be considered as conceptual rationale, for the malocclusion question. Later, they will be widely described, and, their analysis detailed in the specific chapters. It can already be noted, in this first descriptive approach to the masticatory phenomenon, that there is an evident discrepancy, between the occlusal state and the neurophysiological data, indicating extraordinary synchronization and perfect symmetry, of the trigeminal reflexes. These results can be attributed, to anything less than, a malocclusion. We are obviously, in front of an error of the logic language in medicine. In this case, it is more appropriate, to talk about occlusal dysmorphism, and, not malocclusion. Which, as we shall see a little further on, is quite another thing. This video is a review of a conference report held in a scientific meeting in Dubai, by the founder of Masticationpedia. The theme was, Neuronathological Functions, a new trigeminal electrophysiological paradigm, in masticatory rehabilitation. Which in this context generates added value to the contents, of the source chapter. We report the actual congress exposition. We should consider the masticatory system, as a complex system, that does not work in a linear way, but follows a stochastic process. These complex systems, are composed of many elements which interact with each other in order to determine an emergent behavior of the system itself. So, also, the masticatory system is composed of many elements, included in two main blocks, the nathological component and the neurophysiological one. These interact together, to determine, the emergent behavior of the masticatory functions. However, we consider the nathological component, as a deterministic reality because we can touch IT, with our hands, we can observe IT with our eyes and, finally, we can interpret IT, through our current knowledge. While, we consider the neurophysiological component, as an indeterministic reality, because we can't touch IT with our hands, we can't observe IT with our eyes, and finally we can only hope to interpret this system, only after IT has been tested by external inputs, called, triggers. When the two components or the realities are coupled, then we can talk about physiology and maximum efficiency of the system itself. If we want to understand this neurophysiological component, first of all, we have to divide, the brain into three segments, the cortical and subcortical area, the peripheral area, and the brainstem area. As for all the indeterministic reality, we have to stimulate the complex system waiting any response from itself, after that we can quantify the response, in order to interpret the state of the system itself. For the this reasons, we have to stimulate each area, through different types of external triggers, taking into account that, we also have to know the parameters of the trigger itself. We describe this concept, on the article published on Journal, of, Pain, in 1997. For instance, if we want to quantify the integrity and the maximum neural energy, produced by the trigeminal motor cortex, we have to test the cortic bulbar motor fibers by magnetic transcranial stimulation. This device produces a very high impulse of magnetic field, roughly 1.5 tesla, that easily crosses the cranial bone and generates, inside the cerebral tissue, an induced electric field capable of depolarizing the corticobulbar fibers. This electrophysiological event, is called, 
cortex maps. But if we want to quantify cordially the integrity of the anatomic structure of the nervous system, we have to test the trigeminal periphery area. So, we have to depolarize the motor trigeminal route by electric transcranial stimulation. But in order to cross the cranial bone, and to reach the oval foramen, we need of new innovative devices, equipped with two high voltage electric stimulator. We developed a technology called bilateral root maps. We explain the concept of organic symmetry using a neural network model, through MATLAB platform, and published on dentistry, in 2014. The brainstem, is the most critical area to be analyzed, for the complexity of the polysynaptic circuitry, that generates the reflexes. In any case, for our professional field, the most important reflexes are, the jaw jerk, the mechanical and electrical silent periods, laser evoked potentials, and, the recovery cycle, of the masteric inhibitory reflex. We described the laser evoked potentials, and, laser silent period technology, in the article published on the Pain Journal, in 2002.